Hello everyone to our last raid speedrun breakdown, at least for now. It's going to be Crota's End, of course, until the final shape comes out. Now, to contrast against Root of Nightmares, which we talked about very recently in the last video, Crota's End is not really favored by speedrunners. When I did the poll, it was one of the least liked raids along with Vault of Glass for a number of reasons, and we'll get into that. But for now, let's start with the very start of the raid, which is, of course, Entrance. Now, we're going to go ahead and take a look at my POV. And you're going to see that entrance is kind of what you expect, minus a couple things. Obviously, one guy goes and grabs a chalice as quickly as possible. And you'll see that I'm leaving on this skip, going around this kind of turn back, through this turn back area. Going through this hole on the, on the side of the hellmouth. And I'm just kind of dropping down into this turn back area. And then I tab out to, you know, watch a YouTube video that I was making and making sure there's no mistakes in it. Blah, 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 blah. I skip past this. And then I have dropped down into the abyss. So basically what we do here is we have a bunch of players. They skip down to abyss to go and start it early as soon as entrance is done. But why do we have four people skip down, right? You can see that there's me plus the three green dots around me. And then there's two people that are doing entrance. So we bypass doing the whole extremely long drop all the way down to abyss. But um, why four people, right? Why not five people? Why not six people? Why not, you know, three people? Well, the reason for that is this. If I go ahead and we go ahead and look at my friend Mars's POV, right? Crota, the first three encounters at least, there's a lot of stuff where you need to enlighten a bridge as quickly as possible to speed up the encounter. And so what are these three players doing? Well, initially, you only need to actually enlighten this starting bridge twice, right? You can't enlighten it three times before it builds if you are sitting on it the entire time. And so how many people do you need to stay here and how many people do you need to leave on skip? You start entrance with three people. The guy that has his chalice filled up right away can go skip and the other two people, they have to stay. And the reason for that is because this skip is free enough, it's short enough that Crow, even if he fills up an entire chalice and gets it taken off of him and enlightens, he can still make it down there in time. Whereas his remaining two teammates, one of them has to hold the chalice and the other one has to take the chalice off the guy that's holding the chalice. So in this case, Hashira and Mars are chilling here. You might also see that Hashira is on Trinity Goal and Mars is on the fourth horseman. And the reason for that is because the fourth horseman is, as you can see, to kill the knight and the Trinity Goal is to kill the adds. But you might be wondering why do they even bother killing these adds quickly if, you know, it's if they're just kind of waiting for their chalices to fill up, why take the, you know, why bother with this? Well, the reason for that is because this is something that a lot of people don't know when I talk to them that was discovered pretty early on in the raid, and that is that killing adds speeds up filling the chalice by a lot, okay? I'm pretty sure the default, you know, fill time for a chalice is around 25 seconds. You can speed that up in very ad dense encounters down to like nine or 10 seconds if your team is killing adds very, very quickly. So you'll get to see that when we reach an encounter like Bridge, I'll show you a chalice that fills super, super fast when there's a lot of adds and big adds like, you know, barrier champions, for example, that are being nuked at a very fast rate. Now, as for entrance, the only remaining thing here is that Hashira has, you know, created a wanderer tangle and he's grappling to the top of this drop for some reason. And the reason for that is because there is a checkpoint after entrance completes that needs to be hit. It's this drop checkpoint right here. And so Hashira is just doing that so that as soon as he hits that checkpoint, you'll see the objective pop in the top left. And then Mars opens her inventory real quick. And you'll see that right about now, they'll get joining allies to the first encounter, right? So another question you might ask is why not have multiple people stay behind to make sure the ad clear is really, really perfect as fast as possible instead of having a bunch of people skip to abyss. And the reason for that is because joining allies in Destiny 2 takes around 10 or 11 seconds, right? You have the five seconds of the timer ticking down or six seconds of the timer ticking down. And then you have like five seconds or so of just being black screen, no matter how good your PC is. And so because of that, the first 11 seconds of abyss you know, anybody that's staying back during entrance is going to be doing nothing in Abyss for the first 11 seconds. And the first 11 seconds of Abyss are pretty important because we use them to scout out preserves. We use them to start moving the chalice around. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's very important that we have as many people down there as possible to get all of these things, get the ball rolling as quickly as possible. But that's it for entrance. We talked about killing stuff with the chalice to speed stuff up. We talked about multiple people leaving on 01 or entrance skip. And we talked about, of course, the drop checkpoint. So let's move on to Abyss. Now, Abyss is going to take some explanation because Abyss is kind of annoying. And you'll get to see why Abyss is such an annoying encounter to speedrun, but why it's also home to some very unique 
uh, strategies. So right here, right off the bat, I'm going to make a Wanderer Tangle. Now, I mentioned Hashira making a Wanderer Tangle on entrance. And the reason why Wanderer Tangles are used in this encounter, as well as the next encounter, is because when you are burdened, aka holding a relic, or maybe you are you have a weight of darkness, so you can't activate your blind, you can't well skate too easily, right? You're, you're not able to basically activate your second jump. A Wanderer Tangle is a great way to traverse an encounter like this, right? So I'm holding a Wanderer Tangle, I pick up a Chalice, I throw it, and a bunch of my teammates grapple onto it, and we go absolutely flying over all of these preserved locations. So right now, <clears throat> I want to talk about, you know, when it comes to speedrunning, we've talked about approaching encounters as a series of objectives that need to be met. In this encounter, you need to dunk into, I think, five separate preserves, and then, only then, can you enlighten the top plate and start building the bridge at the end of Abyss. So let me go ahead and visualize this for you, and that will help you kind of understand why this encounter is so hated and also kind of unique in terms of speedrunning. This encounter is one of the most RNG heavy encounters in speedrunning Destiny 2, period. Okay? If you want optimal routing, it's like two out of like, I think it was 20 plus permutations that can occur during this encounter that are optimal routing. What is optimal routing? It's when you have a bunch of preserves that are very, very tightly packed together. Okay? Now, the thing about preserves is that they follow certain rules. They can't be like right next to each other, for example. Um, but they also can't be like extremely, extremely far apart. So, <clears throat> for that reason, you can kind of predict which preserves you need to scout ahead of time to talk to your teammates. And if you aren't aware, already aware, uh, I've talked about scouting before, but the second this encounter starts, you can go up to any of these zones and check what zones, what, what specific lanterns, let's say, have the preserve spots next to them. So maybe it's going to be like, you know, 4, 7, 10, 12, 15, right? That's a possible chain, for example, right? Um, you could have players go to zone D or zone E and they can see these preserves ahead of time, communicate to the teammates behind them that are grappling on wonder tangles or maybe lumina grappling, maybe well skating, well bouncing to travel through this encounter. And so those players know where to go ahead of time. Now, the problem with this is that if you've ever been in an LFG, right, when certain people skip to the top and they say, oh, I'm going to despawn the ads. It's helpful because you don't track to as many ads when you're trying to soar down through the maze, down through A, B, C, D, if there's a player up in E and F. But if you do that in a speedrun, all of the ads down here despawn. And so another thing that's important is that players realize that if you try to build an Enlighten after you dunk on E, it's really, really slow. Crota's bridge, right? It starts accelerating hugely the second you dunk your first Enlighten. So it's really, really important that you dunk that first Enlighten as soon as Entrance, as soon as Abyss, you've done all of those five preserves, right? That A, B, C, D, and E. As soon as you're, you're done those five preserves, you want to have someone with Enlighten on the F plate as quickly as possible. So we decided, you know, if we're going to be tra you know, transferring the Chalice over and over again, we may as well make an Enlighten during one of the slow segments, right? So maybe from A to B or B to C or C to D or E to E. So a bunch of things were proposed. We said maybe we do between E and F. Maybe we do between C and D. Eventually, we figured out that between A and B is the best option. And the reason for that is this. At the very, very start of the encounter, between A and B, all of the ads in the encounter are concentrated in one area because the entire fire team is down there. Once you progress the encounter and you have people at C, you have people scouting D, you have people scouting E, all of the ads are separated and so is your team. Some of your team is going to be in an area where there's just no ads at all, so they can't contribute to filling the chalice as quickly as possible. So we decided, to hell with it, let's just fill up the chalice between these very first two deposits. Obviously between, you know, going up to A, that's a very short distance, so it doesn't really make sense to do it here, but between A and B can be a very long distance. And you're going to see that in this particular instance, it is a very long distance because we get the longest possible RNG, which is two all the way to five. So we skip past four, it's not there. I kill some ads with Sunshot. So are my teammates. And then I go ahead and dunk my chalice, or I don't dunk my chalice, sorry. Excluded takes off of me. I get enlightened and he dunks the chalice. And you can see Crow's got his Wanderer Ball, his Wanderer Tangle, and he's going to throw it to the next possible location. Now, uh, besides what I mentioned earlier, some people are going to Lumina Grapple because they don't have ads near them to make a Wanderer Tangle. This encounter basically progresses as a cycle after that. So the guy on B, there's someone on C scouting for the guy on B. The guy has a Wanderer Tangle picks up the chalice out of the preserve, that's going to be Crow in this case, he tangles himself all the way to C, the guy on C, there's someone at D scouting for them, so Crow dunks it in C, makes his way up to the top to get ready for the end of the encounter, and the person on C, they grapple all the way to D, that person grapples all the way to E, so you can see it's kind of a game of leapfrog, so it's a pretty unique encounter for sure, there's some very very unique movement tech 
not so much sword tech, but more like wanderer tech, which is pretty cool. You don't really see that in most raid encounters that involve movement, so pretty unique in that regard. But the RNG is so, so, so punishing. If you get something like 3, for example, as your first deposit in B, it's almost unrunnable, right? So it's really, really bad. The RNG, again, there's only two really, really good sequences if your team is running for a really good time. We didn't get it in record because we kind of gave up because this raid is really, really punishing to run. Um, but if a team ever tries to run this in the future, you'll see that at the end of the preserve section, we're actually plus eight against what is considered a really, really good abyss. So you'll see that as after I, um, after I get enlightened and I have the chalice taken off of me, I go the, all the way up here. I scout 14, 15, which is of course zone E. And I see that it's not 15. It's normally right there if it's 15. So I, I call 14 and then I make my way to the end plate so that I can enlighten it insta as soon as the last preserve is made. But you'll see here that even in a world record, just because Abyss is so unforgiving, the rest of the run ended up being pretty decent, but the Abyss was unfortunately not great. And you can see that we're plus eight right there. Somewhere a plate hums with the powers of the Podium of the Light, and I dunk my Enlighten right away so we can get this bridge going as soon as possible. Now, right here, right here is the turning point in the encounter. The first half of the encounter is done. The second half is just add clear, right? So we did do some optimized ad clear on the bottom floor while I was getting my first enlighten just so I could dunk it as quickly as possible or sorry have it taken off of me as quickly as possible so they could speed it up but this part is where it really turns into ad clear because you are trying to fill up that chalice as quickly as humanly possible so notice everybody here is going to spread out Mars is going to go that way Hashira is going to go this way to the towards the right I'm going to be on Trinity Ghoul just you know killing ads in a mad frenzy as soon as I have the chalice taken off of me I go ahead or sorry, I, I don't, uh, not as soon as the chalice is taken off of me. Someone else brings the chalice to me, and so they can sit on the plate and keep building it. I, since I'm drained of light, I jump off the map, and they go ahead and res me. And as soon as they res me, I'm basically, my drained of light timer is gone, and I can take it off of them. That way there's less transferring of player movement. Everybody is kind of just in their own position here, and we can just keep killing ads. Luca is going to move out because he's not needed on the plate anymore. Crow is going to come back in and take the chalice off of me. Notice the chalice is filling at a relatively fast rate because everybody is spread out killing ads all over this ad dense encounter. Excluded is nuking the unstoppable ogre spawn, which respawns over and over if you kill it and you spawn kill it quickly. And that's pretty much it for the rest of this encounter. We just enlighten the bridge as much as possible. The path becomes clear and we start moving our way to the second encounter of the raid. So what have I talked about this encounter while we're waiting and we're watching the end of the encounter to play out? So I make some special finishers here, obviously, and I make a Wanderer Tangle so I can grapple across the bridge here, nice and easy without crashing into anything. So we've talked about how speeding up the Chalice is very important here. Everyone's on Trinity Goal, something like that. We've talked about Zone RNG, A, B, C, D, E, F, how they can be different preserves and you, you gotta scout that out. We've talked about choosing the optimal Chalice Fill segment. We've talked about Wanderer Tangles, Lumina Grapples, Well Bounces for moving with the Chalice once you have it to the next preserve. We've talked about, you know, pre-scouting. We've talked about distributing players all around that top floor to get that optimal ad clear. And finally, we're going to talk about the last strat before we move into second encounter. Now, something Crota teams discovered pretty quickly is that if you have a bunch of people travel through this white wall at the same time, a bunch of people are going to die. They're going to get teleported to this green elevator area that's just filled with turn back. And you have to wait through this entire turn back timer. It kills you. And then someone has to res you inside of the bridge encounter. Now, um, that's pretty annoying. <laughs> that's that's very annoying because that means that either that person is not going to get flagged or you have to delay the start of the encounter so that person can either res themselves or be resed and get flagged. So that's really, really annoying. And we found that minimizing the players that actually go through the portal, having them stagger themselves and go through slowly avoids this problem. So me and Mars actually don't need a rally and our ad clear rolls, our thralls don't really start spawning for the first couple seconds of the encounter. So it's not super important that we go through. We let our four teammates go through first because they need rallies. They need to be at their doors quickly. And then Mars, once I see her body kind of TP and disappear, I go in to make sure she doesn't die. And I'm in the encounter and I'm just in time to kill my thralls. Missed my thrall there. But I'm just in time to kill my thralls and start bridge encounter. So that's it for Abyss. And now we're going to talk about bridge. Oh boy. Oh boy. Okay. So... We've talked about complex encounters in the past, right? We've talked about Last Wish Shuro, which all with all of its different roles, all of its very specific particular ad clear, you know, early ads, all these crazy cool strats. We've talked about Ron when it comes to first encounter, the crazy specific routing, hyper-optimized alternative routing with different RNG. We've talked about a bunch of different stuff before. 
Bridge is one of those encounters. This is one of the most mechanic, strat-dense encounters in Destiny 2. Super, super precise, super meticulous. And the reason is this, right? You are playing a juggling act when you're playing Bridge, okay? You have the chalice that needs to be filled up as quickly as possible. You have the mid plate that needs to be permanently stepped on in order to build the bridge. You have sword bearer spawns, so they need to be nuked as quickly as possible, and then you need someone with enlightened to be there as quickly as possible, then grapple across. You have people that need to not be, you know, off the totems, otherwise we're gonna wipe. You have ad clear doors that are insanely spread out, right? You have five different ad clear doors that need to be spread out on top of the ledge thralls that spawn. So you have a bunch of things that need to be rotated all while you're juggling hot potato, you're moving this chalice between every single member of the team so that they can get enlightened, right? So this is absolutely crazy. Um, I made a spreadsheet to track bridge rolls uh, one time and it was just a complete mess to look at. And bridge, you know, because during the Crota Zen speedrun tournament, if you haven't watched that, there was a bunch of new teams that were asking kind of how to do bridge. People were spending weeks and weeks practicing this encounter because of how complex it is. And so I made this kind of <laughs> guide on how to do bridge, right? And if you look at it, it is just insanely detailed, right? We have every single player as represented as a, as a letter here and, you know, the chalice is in red and you just have this like, you know, 20 step process on how you move all the players individually from room to room, from door to door, from plate to plate. So. It's absolutely insane how meticulous the strategy is here, but I'm not going to go into the, the hyper specifics. I'm just going to explain kind of what we do to actually speed up the encounter as quickly as possible with the main strategies. Okay, so like I mentioned during Abyss, if we think about Crota Bridge as a series of objectives that you need to finish, well, first you have to spawn sword bearers, you kill the sword bearers, you have to get that sword as quickly as possible to the other side of the map so that they can kill the gatekeepers, dunk the sword, then you do this four times, you do it one more time on the far side to get that fifth gatekeeper, dunk that fifth sword, then you have to clear ads at a specific rate, you know, you know, you have to clear ads in a specific order, you know, you, know, you have to kill wizards, you have to kill ogres on the sides, and then you have those five gatekeepers in the middle, and you want three swords for that as well to kill them as quickly as possible. So, that's a mouthful, how do we speed all of it up? Okay, so you might be wondering, right? I mentioned that during bridge, you want to, you know, build a bridge as much as possible, but why why not just, you know, focus on getting enlightened so you can kill sword bearers? And I'm sure you know that in speedrunning, uh, if you've watched a speedrun of Crota before or you're vaguely aware of the strats, there are ways, you can see this in low manning as well, to get across the bridge without it being built. So why build the bridge at all, right? Why not just have everyone cross, you know, using wanderer tangles or well skating or whatever with a sword? Well, the reason for that is because to actually spawn in the sword bearer, you need to have the bridge built a very specific amount. And that is when the bridge has two segments built. So you see right now it has zero segments built. Eventually over time, the bridge will get these little segments and then it will fully build. Once it has two segments and then a third segment starts to build and you hear the bridge hiss, that's when a sword bearer will spawn. Okay, there's a couple other conditions that need to be met, but at the very start of the encounter, that's when a sword bearer spawns. Okay, in the meantime, we have one person enlightening the bridge, not two. And the reason is we need Crow. Crow is the first person to get enlightened. Or sorry, he's the second person to get enlightened. And we need his enlighten um, in order to do something later on in this encounter, which I'll explain. But in the meantime, just know that we're building the bridge up to that, you know, that two segment plus that one last segment with that hiss, and we're looking for a sword bearer. This encounter is kind of hard to explain because everything is calibrated, right? We spent so much time figuring out who should get the chalice, how many enlightens should we do, when should we be moving players to certain locations, right? All while doing this optimal ad clear, right? Excluded is on left door just nuking the champs, Luca is on right door just nuking the champs, and everybody else is just on Trinity and just clearing the ads as quickly as possible. So, the first sword bearer just spawned, right? The call was left, right? So it's right here, it's on excluded, and for some reason, Crow is bringing his enlightened to the sword. And you might be thinking, well, is Crow going to go pick up the sword? That would make sense, right? No. There is a strategy that was found in the bridge encounter um, that really kind of revolutionized how we approach the bridge encounter. So typically, typically, right? what this encounter was gated to. We've talked about gating and speedrunning before. What this encounter is locked to, right? What is holding back the encounter from progressing? What the encounter was gated to was spawning in sword bearers, killing the sword bearers, picking up the sword, and bringing the sword across. Now, credit to Zemo's team for discovering this, but they found out that you can actually abuse a pity mechanic with the sword bearer by tricking it into spawning an additional sword bearer when you already have a sword on the ground. Now, the way Crota's End Bridge works, right? The way Crota's End Bridge works is that when you spawn in a sword bearer, 
right? And you kill it. If the person with the sword like falls off the map or you let the sword despawn, the game will spawn in a pity sword bearer even though you didn't kill a gatekeeper. Normally, what happens is that if you want to spawn in a new sword bearer, you have to dunk a sword on the opposing side. However, if, like I said, the person with the sword dies or you let the sword sit on the ground for too long, 18 seconds to be exact, if you let the sword sit on the ground for too long and it despawns, another sword bearer will spawn. We call this a pity sword bearer. But what the Zemo team figured out is that we're going to see Crow here. And like I mentioned, right? Look at Crow's chalice right here, right? This is an encounter where there's a crap load of ads. Look how fast this chalice is filling up, right? It's almost like he's cheating. Like, look, look how fast that chalice is filling up, right? Compared to like, let's say an LFG where you're just sitting on the plate for like years and years and years. He fills it up in like 10 seconds or something. So you'll notice he has the option to speed up the bridge build right now, but the bridge is actually already built enough to spawn in the first sword bearer. So what is he going to do? He listens for the, surf, the first sword bearer call and where does he go? He's about to hear it. He hears it now, right as Mars is about to fill her chalice. He hears that it's on left. So he goes to exclude it. And what does he do? Oh, wait a second. He just failed to pick up the sword and he like meleeed the sword. What was that about? Well, apparently, right, and Bungie has fixed this recently, right? They, they've patched this. There are still ways to do this, right? You just have to die as you pick up the sword. Um, but back then, back during the Crota's End speedrun tournament, which was around this time, you could melee or just run away from the sword or basically just interact with the sword in such a way that you canceled the pickup animation as you picked it up and it would drain you and the game would think that you picked up the sword, right? And so if it thinks that you've picked up the sword, but you don't actually have the sword in your hand, Watch what happens, right? We do kind of a fake drain here and Crow is drained of light, but he hasn't actually picked up the sword. That sword will persist on the ground because the game thinks that a player is holding the sword because Crow has drained it here, okay? So the way this works is that once those 18 seconds are up, another sword bearer will spawn. But if a player with enlightened is on top of the sword, the game will think that that player is holding the sword. And so it won't despawn the sword. But because no one is actually holding the sword, it will still spawn in another sword bearer, right? So very, very interesting, you know, interaction of mechanics here. I don't think I've explained it that well. If you're interested in kind of understanding how it works, um, there's a Crota's and you know, speedrun dog in the speedrun panel. You can kind of read um, this kind of couple paragraphs here. I think it explains it more eloquently than I just did. But just know that people call this sword duping. It's not actually duping. What you're doing is you're spawning in a pity sword bear despite having an extra sword on the ground. Okay. So this kind of flipped the entire idea of Crota's End Bridge. Instead of it now being, you know, how quickly can you get someone across to, you know, slam on the gatekeeper, you have an extra sword. And so someone is going to have a sword and be waiting up top for the gatekeeper to spawn. So now the name of the game is actually going to be how fast can you kill sword bearers? How fast can you kill sword bearers? Because what the gatekeeper spawns on the opposing side are actually tied to is not only does someone with a sword have to be near the top of that area across with the bridge, but gatekeeper spawns are also gated to a sword bearer death. So you're going to watch what happens here if I go to my POV. So this whole encounter, it's just going to be a cycle of trying to kill sword bearers as quickly as possible while maintaining the bridge to be built as quickly as possible while still keeping our chalices filled as much as possible. So someone has an enlightened to go and get that sword. So. Watch here, Mars is going to be sitting right next to that sword, and the second that we hear a sword bearer spawn in, right, the second a sword bearer is about to spawn, right at 18 seconds, I tell Mars to pick it up, and Mars picks it up, and I believe she grapples across, and there you have it, right, so she's gone across, and now there's a sword right over here, I go ahead, I pick this up, Luca throws it, and boom, we have two people with a sword across in the first, like, what? minute of the encounter or something like that minute and a half of the encounter and you'll watch here even though i'm here there's no gatekeeper so the funny thing about these fake swords right the swords that we're using to get across early is that yes they can be used to kill gatekeepers but they don't count towards spawning in gatekeepers so now this entire encounter is tied towards killing sword bearers on the home side as quickly as possible and the second they kill a sword bearer you're gonna see that it spawns here so right here, the, the gatekeeper spawns in here. That's because they killed the sword bearer on their side. Okay, so the fake sword bearers, they don't count towards killing, uh, towards spawning in the gatekeepers, but you can use their swords to kill the gatekeepers. Now, this is, I'm, I'm not doing a very good job explaining this, but um, I hope that kind of makes sense. Now, 
another thing that is absolutely worth talking about because we're going to have relic swords in crota as well and this is absolutely essential there as well uh, i'm sure you know from lfgs that debuffs like you know tractor cannon or in this case felwinder's helm can be used to debuff gatekeepers and that accelerates how quickly you can kill a gatekeeper however i bet you didn't know that there's certain buff stacking that you can use to kill gatekeepers as well and basically the way this works is we discovered that if you stack radiant radiant not well of radiance radiant but normal radiant like you know torches radiant if you use radiant plus any other buff they stack together and they actually work right radiant gets cancelled out but the second buff works in order to kill gatekeepers so what is crow on right now he is on lumina right he's giving me lumina and he's on felwinner's helm and he is killing an ad with felwinner's helm near the gatekeeper to do a 30 percent weaken aka like a tractor level weaken to the gatekeeper and also giving me lumina and radiant using ember of torches so I can basically four hit, or in this case, I think five hit this guy because I ran out of debuff towards the end, okay? So this is really, really important because it speeds up the gatekeeper kill, which is another thing that this encounter is gated to. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna call dunk as soon as I dunk this sword. And that notifies my teammates that are on the other side right now to go and look for sword bearers. Because the second you dunk a sword, that is when a sword bearer will spawn on the opposing side. You see excluded has just arrived. And the second they kill the associated sword bearer, a gatekeeper is gonna spawn up top on this side. And now you'll see another thing that we do is we recross back to the original side of uh, bridge because we're spending an extra player that needs to come to this side with the fake sword because we actually have you know more than five swords here we have six swords that are crossing right because we have an extra player my role has to actually go back across by grappling across here tangling across and now i help out on this final section in terms of killing sword bearers quickly so right here i'm waiting out my teammates are going to tell me if a sword bear is about to spawn. I think I believe in this run it spawned somewhere else. So I grab my tangle and I just go across from here right back onto the other side. Oh, okay. I seem to have melee canceled in this case, or sorry, mantle canceled here. So I just make another tangle. I go right across to the other side and right over here, most of the encounter is now done, right? We've dunked four swords, I believe at this point. So now the final sword, we're going to be waiting on it right here the second we kill that sword bearer a gatekeeper is going to spawn and there he is right there we kill that final gatekeeper with the remaining sword that we have and right over here is kind of like abyss right in abyss the first half of the encounter is all movement based right it's movement 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 and then once you're done all the objectives dunking five preserves in this case dunking five swords is kind of the same thing once you're done with those objectives it becomes an ad clear encounter so here we are trying to fill up three chalices as quickly as possible but we're also killing a bunch of ads and the more you kill ads the faster you progress this encounter you need three wizards to spawn you have a left wizard a mid wizard a right wizard and i think it's two mid wizards once you have all of those wizards dead and they're they're all nuked an ogre will spawn on each side a fisher ogre on left and right once those ogres are nuked that's when the gatekeeper spawn in the middle so you'll see here i'm waiting here to kill this barrier champion so that it, or sorry, not the barrier champion. I'm here to kill this wizard, I believe. No, I kill the barrier champion and then Mars galleys the wizard behind him because that barrier champion tends to block the wizard. She gets stuck in the door. So I kill the barrier champion. Mars kills the wizard. And here we go. We pick up a sword here. I miss the barrier champion, but he doesn't matter at this point because the ogres have already spawned in. We pick up these swords and now excluded. He's on strand Titan. So he suspends all of the gatekeepers in the middle. We let them walk towards us. So we can slam all of them at once just like this boom they get absolutely shredded by three swords and the encounter is already over so that's it for bridge <laughs> a very very dense encounter very very long encounter i hope i've explained it i jumped back and forth all the time during that encounter when i was explaining it so i hope it wasn't too hectic if you're curious about the exact strat again um if you go and join the speedrun panel discord or if you look in my discord profile go to my projects folder it's all in the description bunch of ways to reach it there is a speedrun doc that explains RTA Crota's End, the strategy here, in this nice little imager gallery. So if you're curious, you can go ahead and watch that. But uh, I think I'm going to be moving on. So what do we talk about? We talk about, you know, Chalice. We talked about Platon Lightens versus Sword Holders, only doing one Lighten on the bridge, so that we can go ahead and do that kind of Sword Dupe or, or Fake, uh, you know, Fake Sword Bearer, Pity Sword Bearer. Uh, we talked about Sword Bearer spawning requirements. We talked about Gatekeeper spawning requirements. We talked about uh, Sword Bearer, everybody has to watch a door. At certain points with that communication as soon as we call dunk everybody goes and watches a, a door 
We talked about adds, suspending the gatekeepers. We talked about relics and how you can buff and debuff to stack with them to uh, to kill them more quickly with swords. And now we're going to talk about the transition. All right, we finally made it. Oh, goodness me, my voice is just going out here. Okay. Finally, we're going to talk about uh, this kind of transition section. So you get a res token here. So, you know, Bungie cares about this section. It's kind of like a, a little challenge, a little gauntlet before you reach the Iriud encounter. But something you might be noticing is that Crow is currently out of bounds. And so why is he out of bounds? Well, Hashira, if you actually, you can't really see his POV here, but Hashira is going to go to this wall and Crow is actually going to pick up the chalice from him through the wall out of bounds. So what does that actually look like? Let's go ahead and look at Crow's POV. We're going to skip right the way to the end here. So towards the end of this, Crow goes ahead, he kills his uh, ogre with Parasite, and now he's going to make his way up this nice route here. He's going to do a little well bounce to get out of bounds above the bridge final door. And he goes ahead and he turns on his Underlight class item. He puts that on so that he can one-shot himself later on here. And boom, he picks up the chalice right through the wall. And he does a little well skate route. And by doing this, he can actually dunk the chalice from underneath the map out of bounds right here. And so by doing that, eventually the walls will drop and the whole team is going to be able to make it to Iriute as quickly as possible. One more thing while I do have Crow's POV. We are going to do something called a temp perma. So he's going to go ahead and die in the air ute load zone here. And we're going to do something that's called a temp perma. All right. So no, sorry, not in the load zone. Uh, in order to do a death warp, you need to be in an area that has joining allies. So Crow knows that this particular location has joining allies when air ute starts. So he is aiming to do a death warp here. And you'll see that when we start air ute, he's going to be able to warp his res in bounds and actually get off a rally before the flag disappears. You saw it just disappear right then. So I'll explain what the Temperma is and how that works in just a second, but let's go ahead and go back to my POV. Now, um, you might be wondering, well, you know, if the walls both drop at the same time after Crota, not Crota, I just call him Crota, uh, after Crow dunks his chalice at the end in that final preserve past these two walls, you know, it's going to still take the team quite a while to reach Eriud because you're waiting at this wall for it to drop. So what do we do? Well, you can actually use Needle Storm through these barriers, and some of your projectiles, if you look at just the right angle, will pierce through and kill the Shriekers, which will allow you to travel through one of the barriers ahead of time, and that basically allows the team to reach the Iriut encounter just a little bit faster. So, right over here, right over here, I'm going to do something called a Temp Perma. Now, we've talked about Perma Flags in previous raids. Basically, they're flags that exist throughout the duration of the encounter, you can rally to them at any time, you can still only rally once, but basically you can rally whenever you want. The game does not delete the flag while the encounter is going on. Now, in more recent raids, like for example, D2's reintroduced Crota, um, you can't really perma any encounters because Bungie in introduced these erase checks where multiple seconds after the encounter starts, the flags are all erased. However, if you still perma, if you try to perma at a specific time, right? in this case, I'm going to go ahead and start the encounter as I'm placing the flag, the flag will still persist for a couple seconds after the initial erase check and become erased, uh, you know, a couple seconds after the encounter starts. So that's just enough time for the flag to stay so that Crow can death warp in, he can rally, and then he can move forward and continue with the encounter with full ammo. So that's why we kind of do that temp perma start. And now we're going to talk about Iriut. So that's, that's it for bridge. That's it for that hallway transition. Let's talk about the first boss encounter of the raid. Now, Iryu has been kind of butchered. A reason, the reason why a lot of teams stopped running Crota, um, including teams that wanted to run Crota for a better time after the tournament ended, was because Bungie kind of butchered Iryu. First of all, you can't do, um, you can't grab the chalice through the floor anymore, right? You can't grab the chalice through the floor anymore. That happens, I believe, uh, you know, right before I think the tourney ended. Yeah, that happened right before the tourney ended. Bungie patched it out. You used to be able to grab the chalice through the floor, pick it up early, and have someone blink into the right towers so that they could kill those adds quickly and, you know, kill the wizards, right? That's no longer possible. So now what you do is instead of having that be a thing, you have a bunch of people on Stasis Warlock, and in this case, the person on blink would normally blink through this barrier and kill these adds um, just in there, like with them. Um, but we discovered that you can kind of just, you know, shoot Galley through the floor here. And by shooting Galley through the floor, you can kill a lot of these adds. And if you kill the knights quickly, it opens up the doors quickly. And if you open up the mid doors quickly, I'm sure you're aware, it will start spawning in the wizards and shriekers and all of the rooms so that you can scout as quickly as possible, kill them and start damage as quickly as possible. 
Now, because that blink thing is gone, players had to resort to a different method to kill, um, to kill, you know, the wizards. And that is, we're going to go ahead and watch Luca's POV to check out what exactly that strategy is. So Luca is on Stasis Warlock. Uh, I'm sure if you saw Crow rally earlier after that temp perma section I was mentioning, Crow was also on Stasis Warlock. So why are we on Stasis Warlock during a damage encounter? Why not Well, or why not, you know, Strand Warlock for Needlestorm? Well, the reason for that is this. Before Bungie patched this, you could actually squeeze your Winter's Wrath projectiles through these green barriers in order to kill the wizards. So Luca notices here, he has two wizards, he's looking at his radar, he doesn't see any Shrieker vehicle circles, so he just goes ahead and he kills his wizards. So his wizard moves out, he one-shots it, he has Balador's Wrath Weavers on so that his shockwave does more damage, it one-shots the wizard. Same thing here, his wizard's right there, and he can do this left click through the wall and shatter her and kill her through the wall, and there you go. Damage is just about to start right now. Now, the problem here is that Bungie thickened these barriers a lot. And technically, there is a way to still do this encounter. You can throw stasis turrets and they can shoot through the walls at a very specific angle, but they take a lot longer to freeze the wizards than just left clicking with the supers on an instant freeze anymore. And so this encounter became a lot worse to run. And now you can only run certain RNG because if you have any wizards in the right tower at all, those wizards don't like moving. They don't like moving at all. And so your stasis turret can't see them and it's extremely delayed in terms of when your stasis turret can freeze them. And so that's really, really, really annoying. And that makes this raid RNG hell, especially after you've already gone through Abyss RNG, which is why people don't like running this raid too much anymore. Bungie kind of butchered all the cool speedrun tech, including picking up the chalice to the floor, including blinking. Um, you know, you don't have the blinker anymore because they don't have the chalice anymore. And of course, including the uh, the thickness of these walls, right? Of course, in stuff like solo ear you, you can still bait them to the walls, but that's obviously not viable given how long that takes in a speedrunning context. So we've talked about chalice kills, you know, all this while people are on rockets in some cases to kill all the ads as quickly as possible to fill up um, the chalice when that was a thing. Um, I suppose that's not really a thing anymore because we're all in Stasis Warlock. Um, but yeah, everybody just kind of kills their wizards. And once the wizards are all dead, we, I throw a solar nade here to start killing the adds ahead of time. I place my well, and I switch to Cenotaph Mask. And in terms of damage here, right, you might think, well, you know, it's a speedrun. They're probably going to be on rockets. And I think if this team was going for like a final time, like a really, really good time, we'd probably use rockets with Surrounded, because uh, you're basically surrounded by the constantly spawning adds here all the time during this encounter. Um, but, you know, this boss, a lot of people, when they see solo ear you, or they see certain LFGs, right, with, with the boss standing still kind of just right on top of you on the plate, that's great and all, but in a speedrun, if you're really fast on mechanics, Ear Ute is never, ever, ever going to be on the plate. She's always going to be on the middle, long distance, swerving around, moving around, very, very annoying. And because of that, rockets aren't really viable on this boss. Maybe you could do it with like tracking and RDMs or something, but still very, very annoying to use on this boss. So instead, what we opted to do is a precision weapon. So Leviathan's Breath, which is the highest damage per second uh, precision weapon in the game. We just use Leviathan's Breath and Div. Uh, along with uh, Monochromatic Maestro, everybody is on, a lot of people are on Void here. Um, we have someone on Tractor, who is debuff extending using a Void Soul. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's just Levy and Div, you see the Void Soul aura there, kind of circling the the uh, the Death Singer there. And that's pretty much it for, for Ear Utes. I'm trying to read through here to see if there is anything else that changed. No, not really. Yeah, if a team ever ran this back in the future, you could use, um, you know, maybe Heavy GLs instead or rockets instead, but this kill, it's not too bad, you know, it's like a, I don't know, like a 20, 21 second kill, 22 second kill, something like that. I shoot a Cascade Point GL at the end there to kind of finish her off, and now it's time for Crota. Oh boy. Okay, so for being a final boss encounter, it's kind of like, I, I don't know, there's a lot of final boss encounters that I suppose are quite simple compared to the rest of the raid, but Crota is fairly straightforward. I, I don't, I barely even have any notes here actually for in terms of, uh, you know, speeding up the encounter. There's some cool tech that was discovered kind of late into the raid um, that I'll explain in just a second. But besides that, it's just filling up the chalice quickly and um, a bunch of, you know, crazy fast ad clear and then um, picking up ammo that you made during your Ute or off of the sword bear and then doing damage with swords. And uh, we'll go over that in just a second. So you'll notice at Crota starts, a bunch of people sword out. They instantly sword out of this door. And the reason for that is because if you do this, you can actually still start the encounter, but make it out of this barrier in time. And so a bunch of our team is currently doing that. It seems like everybody that needs to do that made it out in time. So 
So now what's going to happen is there's a checkpoint on the outer area of the map here on either side. And if you didn't know this, apparently for whatever reason, you can spawn in the tower knights that spawn in the center as ahead of time by hitting this checkpoint, even before Crota himself spawns in. So we're going to go ahead and hit that checkpoint. And you'll see here in just a second, right? These knights have already spawned in and Crota has literally just spawned in like behind us. That glowing green that you see on, on the on the edges of my screen just now, that was Crota spawning in and the knights have already spawned in, right? So we're killing them ahead of time. I'm using my dead weight to kill them, right? And then you'll see all these mid adds are already spawning in and Crota has just barely started moving, right? So I'm on chaos reach here. I'm killing all of these adds. We're on arc because this season had monochromatic maestro. Uh, which means if you do arc damage, you boost your, your arc sword damage. And in this case, I was on bequest with surrounded, uh, not to spoil anything too soon, but we kill all these ads as quickly as possible. And then Crow, whose POV we're going to watch right over here. He is our chalice holder. He is important to watch here. He's going to pick up the chalice as soon as it spawns in. And sorry, the second it spawns in, he's going to call kill. And the reason why he does this is because all of the people that are in the left and right chambers with all of these orange bar knights and all of these acolytes, they're using Galahorn to kill the adds as quickly as possible. And the second he calls kill, he kills all of them and you'll see his chalice starts getting mega chunked, right? So all of these adds are getting killed left, right, center. You have the sword bearer that's getting killed. He's getting marked and boom, Crow's chalice is filled right when it needs to be. He gets it taken off of him and he instantly goes and he, okay, so notice a couple things here, right? We have a player on tractor Right, we have a player on Tractor, and we also have Crow giving himself Lumina. He's giving himself Blessing of the Sky by giving it to Luca here, and he's also giving himself Radiant. So remember that buff stacking I mentioned earlier? Well, it was previously believed that you had to do some crazy in-air sword combo in order to one-sword Crota. In reality, you can one-sword Crota even on Master using the strat by buff stacking properly, and that is Radiant, Blessing of the Sky, and a debuff, a full debuff like Tractor. So Crow is going to go ahead and do that. He has Radiant. He's going to go ahead and do his one sword. He does his one sword so quickly that he does it even before his sword super is fully charged. So just like that, boom, one sword with more than enough damage to spare. And we go ahead and start damage. Now, damage here, almost everybody is on Lumina Bequest. That way everybody has a 35% buff for most of damage. You're seeing we're, hit, we're hitting some crazy numbers here. He didn't even have surges and he's hitting 106k per, uh, per, per light attack on a sword, right? Which is pretty crazy. We've surrounded from the Tower Knights and the adds underneath us, as well as Crota. And we're basically just spamming Bequest here. Excluded is doing uh, Strand Titan Grapple Melee damage. So everybody has Banner of War here um, in order to boost their sword damage by 10%. And yeah, this bake wasn't particularly good from what I remember, but it was decent enough. We had surrounded for most of the damage phase. And now we're going to do final stand. I'm trying to read here if we have anything else. Not really. Um, there is one thing that's being done here. I think it's Hashiro's POV. Hashiro's POV is blocking with a sword to bait Crota down to bottom left. If Crota is anywhere near the top here, you don't really get surrounded. And um, he can kind of slip and slide out of the person doing the one sword. And that can be the end of a run, obviously, right? So we kind of bait Crota down to this bridge area so that he is in a good spot. Crow tries to place his well on his head so it doesn't break. Doesn't work out too well because Crow, uh, Crota moves around. And now everyone switches to Horseman and Bequest to do some Horseman chunking here. There you go, Horsemaning. And we just kind of Bequest him to death. And that's it for Crota. I feel like I didn't do too much of a good job explaining the strats here, but I don't know. It's kind of a dense raid when it comes to bridge. That really took the wind out of me, I suppose. But I, I think, I, I hope that you can understand why this raid is kind of so behated, let's say, not beloved like Rhoda, uh, Rhoda? <laughs> like Ron is. Um, there's that crazy Abyss RNG. There is a fair amount of waiting around for Chalice, which might be kind of the first complaint you might have as an LFG doing this raid. It's just kind of, you know, you're just sitting there with the Chalice, but you are doing a lot of stuff during, you know, while the Chalice is filling up, as you can see. For example, during Crota, you're sorting out. During Bridge, you're clearing a lot of ads and kind of transferring stuff around and sword duping and whatever it is. So in speedrunning, it's not so much the Chalice, but it is really just the really punishing RNG, right? You have Abyss, which has crazy annoying RNG. You have Bridge, which is a very difficult to uh, execute encounter. You have Iriute, which has the worst raid RNG, I think, of any raid in this game, any raid encounter in this game. And then Crota, I mean, the sorting out thing can be kind of annoying, but that's mostly consistent. So that's pretty much it for Crota. I think I'm completely out of breath now. I think I'm going to go make food. I am starving and very thirsty. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed watching this Crota's end speedrun breakdown. Um, this was barely a sub 10. This raid could go down to like a 920 with a really, really good time. Like you saw that abyss split 
uh, as well as the slightly bad Ryud RNG, but I don't think any team is going to run this anytime soon just because of how annoying it is in its current state. Thanks Bungie for patching out, you know, kind of the, the fun skip stuff that we were doing, but that's alright, it is what it is. Um, next up on the channel, I think I'm going to be doing uh, exotic builds, uh, so look forward to that I suppose. I'm going to be redoing my exotic armor tier list in the form of just ranking builds, straight up builds, not just armor. And um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, we're going to do dungeons at some point, but not yet, in the near future. So stay posted. Um, yeah, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching.